All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We are at the last day of the International Design Conference 2020, Design Futures, Better Normal by Design. I am Anton Sedayo from the Design Center of the Philippines, and I will be your moderator for today. So this week has been so empowering and inspiring, to say the least. We've had almost five or six days of sessions on different aspects of design, and we've gotten the chance to hear it out from excellent design leaders from all over the world. For the last day of our conference, we're winding it down just a notch because today we'll take you on a journey to the self and how to harness your creativity. We have two speakers for today who will talk to you about using art and imagination as a means to rediscover our purpose, to heal and to transform. Before I introduce our first speaker, allow me to thank our solid partners for without whom this event would not have been possible. Adobo Magazine, our official media partner, Buen Salido Architect, and British Council, our event partners. Thank you very much for your support. Our first session is entitled Healing with Playful Art and Imagination. This will be a session on how design can be used for therapy, and I'm really excited for, to take part of this as well. So I won't I won't be letting you go just yet because as always here in IDC, I'll be asking you a poll first just to get those creative juices flowing. So a poll will be showing up very soon right down below. And the question for today is, as an artist, which of these is your preferred medium? One, illustrations, either digital or traditional. Two, writing. Three, videos or photos or four other. So it would be really interesting to see how many illustrators, writers, and photographers are with us here today. And at the same time, if your medium is not in the options, feel free to comment down below or in the comment sections on the uh, pane on the side. All right? Okay, so that's out of the way. Let me introduce to you our first speaker. Our first session for this afternoon will be led by Kara Eskai. Kara is a therapeutic art bio practitioner and works with children with autism and special needs. She is part of the Clinica Salutare therapeutic team and the arts director and co-founder of Masterpiece Movement, a creative and transformative movement offering multi-arts workshops and events for groups and individuals. She is a member of the Anthroposophic Wellness Foundation Incorporated or AWFI, an associate of Philippine Association for Biography Work and Art Therapy or Parati, Pabati, and a trauma intervention volunteer for Freunde Emergency Pedagogy's Philippine team. She is a iShine Art Camp mentor, the middle school art teacher for Colisco Waldorf School, and is a coach facilitator for ICLD Business Management Consulting. So welcome to the virtual IDC stage, Ms. Cara. Hi, Cara. How Hi, are you? Uh, Hi, Anton. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Okay, that's very good. Um, so today, this afternoon session will be very fun, very interactive, and it's great to have you here join us today. So if you have any questions for Kara, feel free to comment them down below, and we'll read and discuss them later during our fireside chat. So if you'll excuse me, I'll be exiting the screen now, and you can start your session. See you later. Hello everyone, my name is Kara. My students call me Teacher Kara, so you can call me Teacher Kara if you like, and welcome to our session. So I'd like to ask for the slides to be started, please, so that we can begin. So our workshop today is Healing with Playful Art and Imagination. So I'm very excited to be bringing this with you. Of course, we are not going to be just talking about art. Today, we'll get our hands right into it in the beginning part of our workshop. We will be doing a few artworks, about three different artworks today to explore imagination and art. And then the second half, oh, but you know, for the first half, I just want to remind you that this activity is also friendly for children. So if you are a parent and if you have a family and you would like to bring in your ch young children ages three to eight, 
then this is something that they could also participate in. Although I am not really an advocate of too much screen time, it would be great if they follow along with you as their guide, as their parent. And that would be the first part of our activity for this afternoon. The second half would be more for the parents. So we'll be looking into what is creativity and how can parents co-create a beautiful, safe environment for our children to live into, especially in this new normal that we are now facing today. And then the third part, hopefully, will be to be able to slow down. Slow down, enjoy, relax, and allow the healing to just unfold within us as we start to connect to ourselves again. So today is not just for children, it's not just for the little ones, it's also for us, the children within us, the children in our inner child. So let's let them out to play today. Are you ready to begin? Let's get started. Okay, so next slide, please. So before we begin with our art, Material, uh, our art activities, we have a few materials to gather. So I understand if you have to rush and grab some stuff. While you're doing that, I will talk about some of the materials we'll be using. So we'll be doing some drawing. With the drawing, we'll need white paper, okay? So any clear blank white paper will do. Crayons or colored pencils, uh, whatever coloring material you have, around that's you know ready and ready to use colored paper if you have some and paste or tape so those will all work well for the painting we'll be doing some wet and wet watercolor painting so ideally it would be great to have watercolor paper so that's the thicker kind of paper if all you have is sketch pad paper that's fine too um, even just regular white paper will work, but it would be great to have a thicker kind of paper for today's activity. We'll need also a, about a one inch brush. So it's a wider brush because it's not a detailed work. It's more expressive today. Um, the biggest brush you have, that would be great. Even a small sponge would work. We'll also need a sponge to wet our paper. We'll need some rags to wipe up in case we have a mess. Three small bowls. I use these little glasses and I place the paint inside them. So I will be showing you also that when we make our paint for the kids, we already pre-dilute it with a little water and that makes it much easier to use. So if you have the kind of paint that you have is poster paint or tube paint or even acrylic paint, that's fine. What we do is we add a little bit of that color and then we put in some water and mix it together already. So that's how we prepare our paint. Uh, the colors we'll be using for today are just the three basic colors of red, yellow, and blue. There. And then for the junk art, so we'll be doing a simple activity with found objects. One of my favorite is the toilet paper tube. So if you have a couple of these, it would be great. One is fine, but if you're working with many other hands around and you have children, then maybe one per child would be also ideal. So we'll be using our toilet paper tubes, scissors for cutting, any scrap paper if you want to embellish it, or we could even use whatever's already on the table. If you have crayons, if you have colored pencils or paint, then that would be excellent. Okay. So don't worry about not having the proper materials. We'll just be talking about what is the ideal setup, but at the same time, whatever you got is already perfect. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so before we begin, because we always are working with our hands as artists and our mind when we're thinking and thinking and thinking of all these things. And now that distance learning is the new normal, we're always staring at a screen. So we oftentimes forget that we have a body to move. So today we're going to start with a little stretch and we're going to stretch not just our body, but also our imagination. So I'd now like to shift camera to show more of me so that we can do a little bit of a follow along stretch. Now, parents, I'd also encourage you to join this little stretch because, you know, sometimes we forget 
that we are at home and then we're doing so many things that we don't even acknowledge that our body also needs to move a little bit. So this stretch is not just for the children, mommies and daddies, grandpa, grandma, you can all follow along, Lolo and Lola, let's all move together. So in this stretch, let's first bring to our imagination the color yellow. So yellow is a really light color. It's very, very bright. And it is almost a white. So let's imagine that our hands are gentle yellow. And the gentle yellow is up high above us. So if you can raise your hands up, try to touch the yellow. Yellow moves like gentle butterflies. So we can move our hands like they're gentle butterflies as gracefully as we can. This is the meaning and this is the color yellow, the feeling of yellow. After the color yellow, we feel that we are getting more energetic, a little bit warmer. So there's a gentle push and it's coming stronger, a little bit more courageous, kind of like an energy pushing outwards. So let's stretch our arms out with a little bit more energy. This is the color of orange. It still has a bit of yellow in it, so it still shines up in the sky but it is stronger, a little bit more courageous, a little bit more forward, orange. And as we come down, we feel the energy coming forward. So now let's bring our arms towards the screen and we're going to stretch out, stretch out and hold and feel all of your muscles start to heat up and start to tighten. Do you feel your muscles starting to burn? Hold on a little bit longer. This warming of the muscles, this feeling of our body, this is the color red. Hold this feeling as long as you can. This is a really good feeling of energy. We feel the energy inside us. We are push, 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 and we push, push, push. And then suddenly we relax and place our hands on our lap. This is the color green. So red and green, they are like brother and sister. They work together, always together. Let's go back to the red. So bring your hands forward and push, 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 and feel our muscles, feel the strength of you. Hold it, stretch out, and hold on. This is the color red. Feel the muscles and release to the color green. So the color green we imagine is kind of like green grass, just gentle with a breeze, relaxed green. Let's come to the color blue. So the color blue is one of my favorite colors. The color blue is coming to an embrace. So let's bring our shoulders together, wrap ourselves up in a beautiful blue, cool blanket. So blue is the color of feeling safe. Blue is holding. We have the blue and it holds us. We squeeze our shoulders together so we can really stretch our back. Take a nice deep breath. Give yourself that love, color blue. Blue hugs, blue hugs for everyone. And then for the violet, we come into this meditative pose. We bring our faces down, and then we start to contemplate in the warmth of the violet. What could I be? Who am I? This is the color purple. And we're back. So as we come back, let's imagine the color that we love the most. Bring it inside your imagination. I hope you enjoyed painting with our imagination. So as artists, the biggest muscle that we work on is our imagination. It's one of the most important muscles we have. So today, we're not going to just work with our hands and work with the different materials. We're also going to work with our imagination. Next slide, please. So let's begin with our first artwork. 
Okay, so let me see. We'll shift the view so that you can see my Blackboard. All right. When we're working with drawing, which is our first activity, we are drawing with our children. And when we're artists, we usually draw really well. So I'm not so sure, does this part of your experience as a parent where your child is always asking you to draw something? And then when they draw it themselves, they feel not satisfied. So drawing is kind of like an uphill climb like this. So we have this uphill movement. And our children, they kind of are like learning how to draw. They're like down here, imagining, how do I climb this mountain? It's so hard. And then sometimes us parents are already up here. We know so much, but how do I teach my child? How do I help my child so that my child doesn't feel like it's so hard to do? And there are so many different steps to get there. So the first step in learning how to work with children is to figure out what is the stage of drawing my child is in. So children go through many stages of drawing. And what's so wonderful about the stages of drawing when you're learning about them is that all children, no matter where they are from in the entire world, will go through all of the steps. So the first step is kind of like creative scribbling, where they're just following the chalk and wondering where it's going to go. Is my child in this stage? Then maybe instead of coming from here and asking my child to do something really hard, the parent can now come over here and walk with the child. So if my child is in the stage of just drawing and scribbling, then parent will also take that on. If the child is in the stage, it's my favorite stage of drawing potato people. then that's also what we will take on as parents. So this is just the basic drawing activity. We don't want to also deprive our children of being able to feel that independence to do what they can do as they grow bigger and bigger and stronger in their muscles, in their hands. So teaching them everything too soon, too early can also be quite hard and frustrating for the, ch for the child. Um, it also makes them quite anxious. So one of the things that we're going to learn today is not just how to draw potato heads. We're going to do a simple drawing activity that we can do with our kids. So this activity, we will need a blank sheet of paper. So you can also use whatever scratch paper you have. It doesn't have to be so, so neat and clean like this one. You can use also colored paper, but I really love using white paper before, especially for this kind of activity that I developed. Okay, so when we're working with imagination, it's a bright, clear day and we look out into the sky, what do we see? What is bright, big and fluffy up in the sky? It's clouds. So the clouds are big. And then when we're, in the, when we're having a great day and we're just staring up at the blue sky with the white fluffy clouds, we'll notice that the clouds have different shapes. And sometimes we'll be able to make the shapes into different things with our imagination. So that's what we're going to do today. Today we're going to create clouds. We're going to create the cloud with this blank sheet of paper. But we're not going to use the scissors. The challenge is we're going to tear the cloud out of the paper by moving the paper really slowly. Now, small children, even if you think that tearing is such an easy thing to do, small children actually have a very difficult time tearing. So what I do for small children is we start the tear with a small nick in the paper, just like this. And then I show them that, oh, we can just move it along. See, just like that, and make the shape go in different directions. 
So when we're tearing our paper, we are making our own fuzzy furry cloud. Notice that the edge of the paper is fuzzy and furry, just like our fluffy cloud. So we're just going to be tearing the paper. This is fun. It's kind of strange because we don't really know what we're doing. We're tearing the paper and we're going to make a weird shape. So make sure that your shape is going inside and out of the paper. You see this? I can't yet identify what it is. The clue when you're doing this activity is that we would like to make the shape as unidentifiable as possible. So we would like to avoid any symbols. So no crescent moons, no hearts, as much as you can try to avoid making cute little hearts, no circles, yeah, no diamonds. We want the shape to feel as wonky and strange as we possibly can. And I'm just making it go in and out, in and out. Where did I learn this technique from? I was researching about one of my favorite artists. His name is Henry Matisse. And Henry Matisse was, favor was famous for being able to draw with scissors. So when he would do his collages, he would do his cutouts, he never drew the shapes and cut out the shape. He would just go straight with the scissors and see if he could invent interesting and new forms of shapes. So we're learning how to tear in a strange shape. And the more strange, the better. There, I think I'm done. It's a nice, strange shape. What could it be? So we're looking now at our cloud. So yeah, you can see that if it was colored, it would already color our imagination or our concept of how we would see it. So this one plays more with our imagination. And what I love about clouds is you can look at them from any direction and everyone will see something different. So it's also a great game to play with kids. Maybe I'll see this and I'll see something else. What could it be? I'm looking at it now. Hmm. It could be a dragon. This could look like a dragon's tail. This could be dragon's wings. This could be the knee of the dragon and the dragon is sitting. What could it be if I turn it around? What could it be? Ha, huh. it looks like it could be a cow or some sort of animal with, oh, maybe it's a big raccoon. He has a big furry flat tail, two little feet for running. And then he has this little cute little face, and maybe there's something riding on the raccoon's back. So we're looking at it, it could be anything. It could also look like a cat stretching. That's true. See, so many different things it could become. And when you make the shape nice and strange, it also gives your imagination a chance to wake up and play. So we have this shape. I want to show you another shape that I made earlier. I made it with my daughter and we were looking at it and then she said, oh, it's a bunny. It's a bunny that has his back facing the same side as his head. He's like twisting and looking, oh, what's that behind me? And then when I moved it this way, she said, it's a fish, a fish, it's swimming away. What could it be? I said, oh, you see a fish? I see a dinosaur. <laughs> and he has a really long mouth and he just came out of the water so you don't see his feet. So what's really fun about making these little cloud shapes is it floats by with our imagination. And look, he can also turn his head, look around, look around. And when we have our little shapes, we can start to create an environment for them. When I'm working with kids, if I'm going to draw um, a picture for the children, I want to make sure that it's a picture that invites more imagination to happen. So if this is my creature and this is, yeah, he is going to hang out there. I want him to have a face. I'm going to keep my face super simple. Just give him a dot for an eye. So why will I do that? 
Well, just in case in the story, as we go through it, he can have different facial expressions. We can imagine more into how he looks. If I give him cartoon eyes, then he'll always look surprised. Then it's like going through life with only one face. And we're not like that. We have so many different things happening with us. So I'm giving him a very simple face so that we can imagine as we go along. And we're also going to now color a space for him to live in. So we can get our crayons or our colored pencils. I love these chalks so that I can color big areas with it. And what I do is I'm just going to create maybe a nice big puddle of blue. And we're going to have some yellow playing over here. Yeah. And we're also going to create some pink over here. And we can have the colors kind of play with each other like that. And then we'll blend all our colors. So if you're using colored pencils, it will take a little longer to color in this nice little color environment for our creature. But this also helps because it sets the stage for our imagination to keep on playing. There. So I colored it really, really simply, enough for us to look at what could this be. Now, I created this here. This could be a pool for the, for the uh, what do you call this? The dinosaur to go swimming in on a really hot day. Or it could be the cave where he lives. Or it could also be a big old mountain that he would love to climb and enjoy the sunset. You see? So when we have these colors, we would like to open up as much as we can our imagination and our exploring of how we can look at it. And then we teach our children how to open up the way they see the world. And then we also ask them to share, what are your thoughts? What do you see? I hope you're enjoying our talk so far. I hope you're getting your hands nice and dirty. So I think because I've decided that he is going to be a dinosaur, we'll make him green. We could make him also a little speckly. That'll be fun. So let's make him green. I'll just rub on the color a little bit. And then I'll add in some spots. We need purple spots. Every dinosaur needs purple spots. There you go. <laughs> there, little shadow inside his mouth. So he looks like he can say stuff. And he can now happily live. Oh, where will I put him? Maybe here. Happily live on this nice little pond that I made and surprise any visitors that are walking by and say, hello, I'm right here. So what I love about making drawings like this is it's not at all about how much skill you have as an artist. It really pushes us to open up our world on thinking what are different ways we can do something, what are different ways we can see something. It also simplifies the whole thing about, oh, I can't do art because I don't have the materials, I can't afford it. So this one is really, really helpful for us to be able to see that art can really be done anywhere with the most simplest of things. So we can also show in, I think, I think Anton is here. He may be doing something on his own. Anton, would you like us to see what work you've made? Have you been able to tear something out yourself? Yes, I have. What did you make? I'm not sure what it is, but it looks oh, interesting. It looks interesting. I wonder what it could be. Is it a jellyfish? Is it an octopus coming out of something? <laughs> what could it be? It looks like, it looks like the oh, it's got a face. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It's got a face. And it's got two little arms also. 
So I think he can participate and play with my dinosaur. Yeah. yeah. So we can make our little world come alive. Did you enjoy doing this? It's just a really simple activity. And what I love about this is you really don't need to have a lot of skills to be able to make art. It makes it into something, an activity that really anyone can participate in doing. And it stretches our imagination muscles. So our imagination muscles, they are very, very important, very essential in life. They help us also work through problems and challenges because the imagination is very expansive. So we'll move on now to our second art activity. So I'd like us to show the next slide, please. So now we're going to move on to art and feel. So for this activity, we'll be doing a little, a simple little story in watercolor. So since watercolor is a heavier material, I will be bringing um, our camera to face down and then you won't see me during the time that I'll be showing you the different painting techniques that we'll be doing today. So it, this is a good time to start to refresh your table, move away the little creatures that we just made, and then create a nice fresh space that is safe on their desk. Um, we're working with watercolor, so be mindful that your water container and your um, jar for washing your brush is not anywhere near a plug or even a device. So especially when working with younger children, we need to be more mindful that little hands might be a little clumsy. So let's let's make sure that our safe is our space is really nice and safe. Oh, I think Ken would like to show us something also. Is Ken there before we move on to the watercolor? Hi. Oh, Hi Ken. Okay, Hello. So yeah, whenever I look up in the sky, I would always see, I don't know, it's pretty weird, but I always see some seahorse on the ocean. <laughs> so oh, maybe maybe it's also the way, maybe it's also the way that um, every time I lay down on, on the grass and then look on, at it at different angles. So I always see that shape of, sometimes I see a, um, I see a turtle shape, or sometimes I also see a sea or shape. So it depends upon, it depends, it depends upon the angle or how I lie down on, on the grass. It, it, it really, um, it really changes the way how I see or, or imagine certain, um, certain, um, animals or plants or anything about the clouds. Oh, that's really amazing. I love how when you, you said that you always see like a seahorse or a turtle, it gives so much of your character. It comes out in the drawing. I love little seahorses. They're so curious and <laughs> super yeah. teeny tiny, you know? So when you watch them on those videos and documentaries, you think they're big, but actually they're such a tiny little creature. So I'm so happy that you shared your artwork with us. Thank yeah. you, Ken. Maybe it's because I was raised in Boracay. That's why I wow. really love seeing anything that that's is related amazing. to. That is amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. So now let's move on to our watercolor. Are you going to join us for that one too, Ken? So let's yeah, move on to the watercolor. So for those who weren't able to um, prepare watercolor materials, no worries. We can just use the crayons or the colored pencils that you have and try to mimic by coloring just the way I did with the chalk. You know how I did it in strokes like this that are very wide. So for those who have colored pencils, you may need to hold your colored pencil in an angle like this so that you can color with a wider space. Or if you're using crayons, the same. Now I love to use crayons that way. Um, as an art teacher, the first thing I do when I get crayons is I peel the wrapper. And that gives me more crayon tip to use. So I'm never always just coloring with a tip. I'm also using the flat side of the crayon to color in bigger sweeping areas. And that helps me use simple materials in new ways. Okay, so we'll be working now with our watercolor and I'm going to start to tilt down my picture screen so I have here my watercolor paper. And the first thing I'm going to do 
is wet my paper with a sponge. So I have here a wet sponge. And I need to carefully do this also because I have some gadgets that are very nearby. And I'm just going to wet the whole surface of my paper this way. So when we're working with a sponge, it helps us spread the water nice and evenly. We want to make sure that our sponge is not drippy. It's just really wet. And we're being very gentle with our paper. So now that my paper is wet, it's starting to curl. I'm flipping it over. And I'm going to now wet the other side as well. So we do this very slowly. Because the paper is like us, it has to drink very slowly. If you drink too fast, the water just goes down all over you to your shirt and your clothes. We don't want to do that to the paper. The paper might choke, right? So we also will give the paper a chance to drink very, very slowly. So now that it's all wet, you'll notice that it's more flat. I'm going to flip it over again. And I'm going to wet it one last time just to make sure that he has enough water to drink and he's no longer thirsty. So why are we wetting our paper? Because today we're going to do a wet on wet watercolor technique. And wet on wet helps our paint come alive. So when our paper is wet, the watercolor, when it touches it, it likes to move. And for younger children, this is a really good activity to do where we are moving, or we are letting the paint move with them. There. So I'm just releasing the air bubbles by lifting the paper gently. There. So that you can see there are no more ripples happening on my page. So let me just check that you can see the top until here, the sides of my paper. And then I will move it slightly like this. Okay. So I'm going to prop it up a little bit so that you can see it even better. Let's see this and this. Okay. So I'm going to start with my brush. My brush is a really good friend. He is the friend that will help me wake up all the sleeping colors I have. The special moment in front of me where there's white paper is a giant playground where all the colors would like to make friends and play. So I have here my paintbrush and I'm going to start by dipping it in the color yellow. Yellow, you see, is a really good friend of mine and he has started to wake up. So I'm placing a little bit of yellow in the middle of my page and yellow is starting to wake up. So he twinkles his little yellow eyes and he starts to open up and then he starts to see a little bit more of the world around him. He stretches his arms. He's getting so excited about being awake. So yellow is really happy. He's coming alive and he's growing growing bigger and stretching his muscles out into the paper. We are so happy to be with Yellow today. Yellow is having a really great day. So as you can see, we're just painting and exploring. What are the colors feeling? What do the colors want to do? Yellow wants to explore. After a while, Yellow starts to feel a little lonely and starts to think, oh, I think I would like to invite a friend to play with me. So Yellow looks around. So I'm going to wash my brush now and dry it because I'm going to start with a new color. So I'm drying my brush to make sure that when I start with a new color, it's not a watery, watered down color. So now Yellow is going to look for his friend Blue. Blue is here, but he's still so sleepy. So in the bottom of the page, I'm painting some blue. Blue says, I'm not yet ready to wake up. I don't want to go out yet. Please leave me. I'm so sleepy. So blue is down here, stretched out in the bottom of the page. 
And he's so happy being blue, so happy being cozy in his little blue blanket. He's stretching out, but not yet. He says, not yet. It's still too early, yellow. Go back to sleep. And this is our friend, blue. But yellow isn't content with that. Yellow is so excited. Yellow says, it's a beautiful day out. I think it's time for us to go have some fun. So I'm washing my brush now, and I'm going to get a little bit more yellow. So yellow starts again from his center. And then he says, I'm going to wake up blue very gently. So he starts to say, hello, blue. It's time to wake up. Hello, blue. Come join me. The day outside is so beautiful. Hello, blue. Let's wake up. Let's go outside. And before we know it, blue starts to get excited too. It's starting to form a new color. It's starting to look a little green. So here comes our green and blue so that our green will become more and more beautiful. Let's bring back a clean brush with more color blue. So here comes our blue and he's starting to wake up into the yellow. He's starting to move and say hello with the yellow, starting to get excited a little bit too, but still very heavy over on this side here. And we're going to go back and forth with blue and yellow until we create a beautiful shade of green that is nice and excited and happy there. So as blue is very sleepy still, starts to explore the garden. See, I'm making long strokes now, just like the grass. He's so happy now to be out with yellow out with yellow, forming this nice relaxing green, filling up all this beautiful space. So we have here very happy blue, very happy yellow, and very lovely green. They start to go through the, for the, the grass and then they find something special hiding in the grass. What could it be? So I'm washing my brush now and I'm cleaning my, with my clean brush, I'm bringing in the last color. So hiding somewhere in the grass, we find a beautiful little butterfly. And this butterfly is so happy and so excited to say hello to everybody. That his wings start to stretch out and it starts to open up and starts to get more and more excited. Here comes this beautiful red butterfly, so happy to be part of this world. And then yellow says to the red butterfly, I'm so happy to meet you. So red comes and gives the little yellow butterfly a gentle blown kiss. And it turns the little butterfly into a beautiful shade of orange. And this little yet red orange butterfly also wants to say hello to the blue. So it comes out now and with its wings, it starts to blow kisses towards the blue and it forms a little bit of a lovely shade of violet. There. So this is our color story for today. <laughs> it's a very watery watercolor day. Were you able to make your little shadowy colors? Yes. Let's look at Anton's work. He's showing us his work. Oh, look at that. Look at that orange. It's interesting, right? Even with crayons, we can bring yeah. out the colors. So when we're working with crayons in this way, a colored pencil is cool. When we're working with crayons or colored pencils in this way, it's like we're working with paint. You know, it stops being a drawing tool and starts becoming and transforming into a painting tool. Nice done, nicely done. Oh, okay, let's look at Ken. Wow. I see, oh, look at that butterfly. 
He looks so free and excited. How are you, Ken? Did you enjoy it? Oh, we can't hear you. Um, I enjoyed it. I never thought that um, this could be super, like it allows you to be more free. You don't need to control anything, just mix and match and, and that's it. And then everything yeah. comes into place. There you so, go. Yeah, so for today, I really wanted to make sure that it felt free. That's why I created a very, very simple story. And as parents, this is really what we do when we're working with our kids. We're, we're imagining simple stories, and you can change the story as you go along. And what's fun, too, about having children around is they contribute to the story. So your story can start out with one way and then take a completely different adventure after. So this is an artwork, an activity that's not so hardened in the lines. You know what I mean? It's something that even with very simple skills, because, you know, children, when they're holding a paintbrush for the first time, they have these tiny little hands. They don't yet also know how do they hold a brush? You know, it's kind of hard for them. So some will even hold it this way. And then the expectation for us to make something good you know, it can actually be very tiresome on the children. So thank you for making your art with me. We have one more activity lined up. So let's bring on the next slide. Okay, so the next slide we have is play. And for this activity, we're going to be making a sculpture. Okay, let's turn my turn my camera a little bit so we have more space. And we're going to be using the magic toilet paper roll. So let's bring ourselves closer to the screen now so we can see what we can do with the toilet paper roll. Now I like toilet paper rolls because one, they're so easy to find, you know, they're free art material because after you use the toilet paper, you end up tossing them away. So they're very, very good materials. They're also very soft for younger hands to press on. So when you have your toilet paper tube, don't be afraid to kind of crumple it a little bit so that it's a little bit destroyed. Yeah? Because when it's softer, it becomes like clay. And it has a lot more possibilities. What I like about the roll, though, what makes it special and different from paper is that it's not flat it's already a three-dimensional tube, but it's plain enough that anything can happen to it. So let's look at this little piece of unassuming toilet paper roll. What could it be? This one is even starting to unfurl. So I wonder what we could make out of it. I look at toilet paper rolls as little caterpillar cocoons ready to transform. So I wonder what this will transform into. So I'm going to use this roll, and maybe I can transform it into, hmm, let's see. Will I cut it? I'm going to fold it in. I'm going to fold it in this way, fold it in that way, and make it a little bit sharp. So did you see what I just did? Oops, this one's broken already. So let's do it again. We're going to fold it this way, like that, and fold it again it could become very sharp. This could become a castle, I wonder, or a crown. Or it could become a chair for a doll. I wonder what it could be. So much like the cloud, it has a lot of possibilities. So we're looking at this toilet paper roll and transforming it. I think this could become a little bird because it has a beak already. So to make it into a bird, I'm going to get my scissors and I'm going to snip a tail. So I snipped two little cuts in it like that. This could become a rocket ship or it could become a fish swimming away. So now that I have a tail, I'm going to fold it in again like this on the butt. And then I'm going to push it in here and push it in there. <laughs> and it's starting to have the body of a bird. So if I cut it even more, I could even put 
little feathers on the bottom. It still looks like it could be a rocket ship. It could be many different things. But what's cool about having a toilet paper roll is now it can transform into different things because it's so simple, it's already 3D. So it's something that we can really play with. I'm going to give it two little eyes so that the expression is also not too overwhelming. And maybe a nice yellow beak. Let's add a little orange to it. There. So it's a really little happy bird. I'm going to add some wings. <laughs> Do you see the bird? You could fly. Cool. Yeah. Then you could color the tips of the feathers. There. So with our cardboard world, we can also go into a more 3D expression. It's not just playing with paper, not just moving with colors. We could also sculpt by using our strength of fingers, by using our muscles, and we can find things that are interesting. You'll always know a young artist when you start seeing them picking up trash, because artists find um, the most interesting uses for things that we throw out. So let's see if, if Anton would like to show us. I know we worked really quickly with this activity, or even Ken, if you have something, feel free to show us what you've got. I used the cardboard box. Whoa, okay, so it's giant. <laughs> it's kind of giant. And it looks like a, um, a spaceship or a manta ray. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It looks like a spaceship. Wow, that's so cool. You can you can go to the moon and back with that with that artwork. That's so cool. I hope you enjoyed it. Did you enjoy making it? Yes, it was like it was fun to cut and you know try to figure out what um, abnormal shapes and abstract shapes you could get. That's just a cardboard box. Yes, yes. And then it's nice because you're opening it up, right? You're not just thinking flat. It already pushes your mind to think of something in a 3D way. Thank you so much. Okay, let's look at Ken. Ken, what do you have for us? Oh, it's a squid. Is that a squid? Octopus? Yeah. What is that? Uh, anything. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. I think it has more than eight legs. So definitely it could not be an octopus. Yeah. It could be a, I don't know. Uh, you plus I, for, I forgot I forgot to count the legs. So, but it's a, just it's a enjoy the octopus. Yeah, it's a hybrid. So maybe that's why the tentacles are more than eight. Can, you can, you can grade the ship yeah. now. <laughs> it can go to the ship and join the aliens <laughs> also. <laughs> a jellyfish. It looks like a jellyfish. <laughs> but I love squid. Yeah. Oh, oh no. Goodness. I oh, eat squid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you, Anton. So I hope you enjoyed the first half of our workshop. We're going to go really quickly through the other slides just to kind of bring all the thoughts together. So thank you so much to bring, for bringing in the children and bringing in the child inside you out to play. So now let's look at the art of reflection. So art is really a way for us to explore our inner world. When we're doing art, we don't feel so limited by our circumstance anymore. So given the times that we are in now, this challenge, this being quarantined, being home, not able to move, especially for the children, they feel it so much, their friends aren't around. With art, we can kind of open up the door a little bit. We can actually give them space to breathe. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at plants, when we're planting a seed, there are three main gifts that we can give to plants. We can give them light, we can give them water, we can give them soil. So when we're looking at these gifts that we give to the plant, we also look at it in terms of how much do we give. If we have too much light, what happens to the plant? If we have too much water, what happens to the plant? So too much light and the, the leaves will dry up. Too much water and it will drown. Too much soil and maybe the plant will never grow. 
maybe it will feel like it's too heavy. So when we're creating a space for learning for the children, we really would like to give what is just enough. When I'm learning more and more about plants, I've also learned that sometimes less than what we think is needed actually helps the plant grow better and survive and thrive. So sometimes we're thinking we're overcompensating, we're really doing too much as parents. It's really a chance for us to slow down and simplify what we do and include them in how we're working in our life. Next slide, please. So how do we cultivate creativity? I love this quote by Albert Einstein. So we have education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. So when we're looking at learning, distance learning, doing art, doing art lessons, many times what we're doing is increasing the number of skills that we know and that we have. But when we're learning and learning and learning, is that really what it is to become smarter, to be able to be out in the world and solve problems? Not really. So what's more important is really being able to practice the thinking, to help the child understand what is, what is it that I need to figure out my own problem. If I have a problem, then most likely I don't really know how to, I, I don't have the skills to figure it out. I have to come up with something new. So thinking is actually very important for children. And sometimes when we are putting so many skills on the child, it, it actually cuts off what they can do in terms of thinking for themselves. So let's see the next slide, please. So when we look at the child, we're actually looking at children as little plants. You know, we're providing the best environment for them because children actually will naturally grow. It's what I really love about it, is when you're doing drawing with children, you don't really need to teach them how to draw. They will naturally go through all the stages of drawing from crib scribbling to potato people to making um, giant ladders and mandalas until they start to form house structures and really elaborate designs of furniture and home. So children will naturally go through the whole gamut of how to learn how to draw and how to create a picture. So all we can do is provide the perfect environment and, and literally not get in the way. So how are we cultivating creativity? How are we providing them with a space so that they can also see themselves, they can also think? They can also challenge what they know, and they can go beyond it every time. Next slide, please. So I have this inner guide for artists. So this is a really good, um, you can call them tips. These are really more of when I'm doing classes, I say this a lot to the kids. So I have here this, um, this, First thing that we say is mistakes are our friends. They lead us to new adventures. So when we're seeing that mistakes are things that are wrong, it always stumps us when we're doing our work. It's very difficult to move on from something that you feel wrong. And then usually children keep changing the paper and then they don't want to look at their mistake. But that's where we get stuck because every time you take away that that moment from the child where they get to look at their mistakes, they can't learn from it. So mistakes are actually friends. So when they're very young, it is also good for us to try to help children to see mistakes as friends. And you know, as adults, it's very, very difficult. It's a, a lot of unlearning to do, but with children, they're more willing to make friends. So this is something that we can also include in the language of our children. Um, another is art adventures do not always follow your plan. I wonder where this artwork will take you. So if you notice that the artworks that we prepared today, all of them are what we call open-ended activities. So there's some sort of plan in terms of I need to get the ingredients or the materials for this artwork or activity, but where it goes, where the adventure takes us, that will depend on the child. That will depend on how curious and how hungry they are to go on this adventure. So our job as parents, as caregivers, is to really activate that hunger to give them that space so that they will want to go all the way and figure out the next part of the adventure without us. And really, they have all the energy anyway, so we may as well unleash it and let them just have fun. 
So art is unique. Even if we do art together, our art will always be different. So it's not about copying mommy. It's not about copying teacher. It's like, show me what's interesting for you. Oh, how did you do that today? I love what you added. That's different from mine. And we celebrate the differences. We celebrate the creativity rather than we choose what we like. And then we say, that's so pretty. You know, and then it kind of stops there. We really want to encourage children to be creative. And then we also acknowledge them where creativity is discovered. So there is also a time for quiet and a time for sharing. When we're looking at, when we're making an artwork, it's also good to let the child experience that quiet. Are we overstimulating children by providing music, by showing them art shows, or are we letting them also open up themselves on the inside and discover how limitless an imagination really is? Next slide, please. So let's create spaces for imagination. So when we're creating spaces for imagination, I remember when I was a child, I would go into these moments of daydreaming. So unlike now where we have helicopter parents and the parents are so involved in making sure that our children are scheduled from the point when they wake up all the way to the end of the day, by the end of the day, the child is so filled up, they don't even get to think about what they did. And if you ask them, what did you do today? They'll just go, mm -hmm. they won't even use words. So it's, so it's like looking at a child as just something, are you looking at the child as something to fill up? Or are you also exploring the child as a space where the child can discover, unfold, just enjoy and see who they really are as they grow into beautiful human beings? Next slide, please. So creating a space for imagination, I have here another quote, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited, imagination encircles the world. I love it that I, Albert Einstein said this because Albert Einstein was not a very good student, you know, but he was such a brilliant mind. So when you're looking at knowledge, knowledge is limited. Knowledge can be found in a book. Somebody went out, discovered it, and put it down. But imagination, it creates from nothing. So if one day nobody decided to make a better drawing tool, to put a piece of um, charcoal inside wood and make a pencil, we'd never have a pencil. So imagination is actually a gift. It's a, it's a way for us to see into the future, to create and design a new future where we can't even, we can't even know what is going to happen, like for now, in these uncertain times. So imagination is very, very special. Okay, next slide, please. So let's just do a recap of what we went through. I actually went through the activity super, super fast after. We have here the plant again, and we have the elements, the light, the water, and the soil. So you'll notice that the first activity we did was entitled Imagine. So in light, we are opening up our space to imagine. We let the light come in. We let the light awaken our thinking. So this is the space of imagination. The second space that we created today in our art is the space of water. We allowed ourselves to feel. With the colors, we feel. When feeling, I can understand myself. With feeling, I can understand the other. I can see when my friend is sad. And I can understand if my friend needs a little bit of cheering up, a little bit of yellow. So in colors, we get to move how we feel. And it's also very important. The third element for planting and growing our seeds is soil. So soil is the hardest of the materials. It's the most gritty. So I brought in the element of play. We made the bird. We folded and crunched all of these cardboard paper. I used very kid safe materials, right? We used our cardboard tube because for this, there can be more independence also for the child to work. It's not, a, it's not a material that needs a lot of adult supervision. Even folding it and crumpling it is something that smaller hands can manage on their own. So we have the light, the water, the soul, the soil, 
light water soil, we have imagine, feel, play. And with these elements, when we really look into our thinking, our feeling, and our doing, we're actually looking at the whole child, the whole human being. And with this human being, we can also facilitate a space for healing to naturally occur. In this time when we're going through a lot of stresses, there are so many tensions, so many things to do. Um, the peg that I have for myself as a mom, as an art therapist, as a mentor, as a coach facilitator, the wearing of so many hats, the managing of so many schedules of finances, everything. It's kind of like spinning plates, like the circus performer where you have so many plates spinning at the same time, you know, and you're really afraid to drop something. There is no space to breathe. So we're looking at the plant. Are we overstimulating ourselves? Are we overstimulating our children? Are we giving them that pause? Are we giving them that break? So it's a really good question, a really good consideration to have. And in the Great Reset, I think that's really what is key to do at this time is to take that pause and to also see and reassess where have we been? Even the way we were living our life with all its rhythms and routines, was that even good for us? Were we happy with that? Or is this an opportunity now to move forward in a new direction? Next slide, please. So every child is an artist. The problem is to remain an artist once they grow up. So Pablo Picasso, he spent so much time. If you look at his life, he was a very fantastic, gifted painter. He copied realistic paintings. He could do everything a regular artist could do, but it was never enough. So his entire life, he spent on learning it and learning to paint at the speed of a child. So as parents, we could be like Pablo Picasso. We could rediscover the child within us. We could open up our creativity. We could open up our imagination. We could unleash also this, this energy of who we are into the world. So as a gift to our children, as designers, as parents, let us also give our children this space to creatively flow, to be able to open up their imagination, to be able to breathe, Thank you so much for participating in my activity with me. All right. Hello, everybody, again. Hi, Kay. Ka Kara, sorry. Um, it was a very fun session. And like what I shared earlier today, I have a dinosaur that will be playing with your dinosaur over there. <laughs> Thank so you so much. We're definitely reminded about tapping our inner child. And of course, cultivating a creative space and for learning with children and accepting that with beauty comes the small mistakes. And with these small mistakes, we learn how to create and make it beautiful. And as well as creating spaces for our imagination and nurturing it like a growing flower. All right. Thank so you so much. Sarah, a moment before we go to our question, because we need okay. to review the verdict and our polls that we did before this session. So earlier we asked our audience, as an artist, which of these is your preferred media? Um, one, illustration, two, writing, and video, photo, and other. So the highest percentage is video and photo. All right. And then and the next highest rating we do have is for writing. So how do we nurture that with writing? No? And at the same time with illustration. All right, thank you. Thank you very much um, for giving us that insight for our audience. Um, I'll visit our Facebook page later to check on those who answered others so that we can have an idea about them too. So Kara, are you ready for a couple of questions maybe? Sure, yes. I welcome questions. Yes, that's good, that's good. All right, first question. Maybe have the first question up. So how can art workshops help silence our inner critic. Oh, well, the inner critic, it's really something that will never be silenced. It's always going to be there. So I think the hardest thing is to hope that it will shut up. 
So I think what I do with my inner critic, because even as an artist and I've been working so many years with my inner critic, I know how it talks, you know, I know it so well. So what I do is before I enter my space of creation, I set the critic aside and I say, thank you. I love what you're saying. I'll listen to you later. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and then you just go for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's about managing how much you're able to tell yourself that uh, you have to move forward as, um, aside from listening about listening to comments or suggestions from other people. It's about managing yeah. that within yourself. Exactly. Especially the comments from other people. Um, I noticed that the comments that hurt the most are the comments that you already think about yourself. Yeah. That's correct. You know, so if you have a comment that actually you don't relate to, you'll just go, huh? Okay. You know, it, it doesn't, it's like it just, it just misses you. But if the comment sticks, maybe there's something in your thinking that is helping that comment stick. Yes. So a comment never comes from outside. A comment always comes first from the inside. So the inner critic, I think the most realistic way to work with it is that it will never go away. And then that we also acknowledge that it's there. Because if the critic is just running and running, then you start to think, this is my real voice. Yes. This is who I really am. And who I am becomes limited to that critic, yes. which is not true. All right, next question. When we think when we, think we are not creative, how do we unle unleash our creativity? So maybe for those who feel that, oh, I'm not creative, I'm not artistic or artsy in any way. How do we tell them, no, you are? We learn from the experts, and the experts are children. Mm -hmm. You know, they are the most creative. You give them a chair, they will not sit on it. They'll turn it upside down, they'll stick their toys in it, and before you know it, it's a fortress. Mm -hmm. So children will not see things the way we adults are conditioned to see things. Correct. What is missing in us adults is the element of play. Yes. So that's why in the title of my workshop, it's really playing with art. You know, how do I enliven play inside me? And that if I'm having fun, more and more doors will open that I never even noticed before. It's about unleashing really your inner child, going out to play so that the, the creativity can pour out again. It's good. All right, next question. Do we have any questions? This is from Susan Reyes. In this age, when we are so fixated with productivity and getting this done, how can we create spaces for play and imagination? Yeah, it's to start putting blank spaces in our calendar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because when we have this productivity, sometimes we become um, slaves to productivity, which is not exactly healthy either. Like now that in, this, uh, in this time, we have so many people learning new skills, right? Baking, you know, and then um, organizing or redecorating their house. And it, it really also puts a lot of pressure in the self to perform. So it may not really be healthy to be very productive. We're also looking at, do I have enough spaces of, of just blank things in my, you know, in my calendar, just so that I can see myself, be with myself, breathe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's more about giving oneself your own space to be able for that creativity to come out. Yeah. With my daughter, we have nonsense talk time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just that moment of you're just hanging out together and then you throw in a weird question and then you don't know where it's going to end up. And there's really nothing productive about it, but mm -hmm. it's time well spent. I mean, yes. We get to know each other as each other grows. And then I always get amazed because I, I'm so surprised. Now, how did she come up with that? Her thinking is so different from mine. Yes. And then I enjoy the moment so much. Absolutely. It's very um, inspiring also and how it makes, it makes us think about how we can engage our inner inner weirdness in some sort of way. Okay, exactly, yeah, question. yeah. Do we have a next question? So from Mr. Franco Antonio, what's your advice to parents who are overwhelmed with their own emotions and are having a difficult time managing the emotions? What are ways we can hold space for our children? Yeah, well, in these times, there are always those moments that, you know, we also need our own space and our own time. 
So it, you know, it's it's to be able to give our spell, ourselves as adults that space to breathe too. Mm -hmm. So if you need to take that break, take that break. If not, you'll explode. Yes. You know, and it's also not fair to the child. They don't understand why mom is not okay, why dad yeah. is not okay. So in these times when many things are changing around us, there are also many losses and grief grief from loss of job, grief from loss of loved ones. It's very real and it takes time. It's not something you can move on from in a week. You know, it, it's, it's a shift in the way we are used to doing something and then it's not there anymore. So we also need to give ourselves that gentleness, that love. And in a way, it's also modeling that for the child that it's okay to not be happy because the child will also have times of not being happy. So if they see that mom and dad have that space to be not okay, but they're handling it in a responsible way, and then it's also healthy for the child. All right. Thank you for that question, Mr. Franco Antonio. Do we have a next question? All right. So. With regards to the previous question earlier today, what are other activities we can do to cope up from emotional burnout and frustration? Other activities aside from art. <laughs> you know, art is a great activity because you are working with your hands. You know, it's, uh, it's an activity that's not so much just in the head. Although you use a lot of your imagination, you get to connect to your feelings. But we are moving our hands. We are moving the paint. You know, we are involved in the creation of something that is real. So any activity that helps us move into, you know, move our physical selves is an activity that will help us with emotional burnout. It could be growing a plant, you know, sticking your hands into the dirt and then try to like check on your little seedlings. Are they growing? Am I watering them? Then it brings you also out of this self self thinking and out into more more relatedness to others, so you don't feel so alone. So there could be many different things, even cooking. You know, because when we cook, then it becomes something that we can share, and others can also enjoy the nutrition and the value of what we have prepared. So it's not just in doing art, it's really just getting the self involved. And then especially in emotional burnout, you know, where there's so much feeling. So it's the body that needs to move. It's the body that needs to come forward. Sometimes in emotional burnout, it's not really the over-processing of why am I sad? That may be maybe not actually able to get us out of it. But when we're moving our body, going for a walk, which now is not so easy to do, you know, you have to, you have to really plan your trips out and even going out, it can be stressful. So it's learning how to do certain activities that are manageable within the space that you have. That's also safe and healthy for you at home. All right, it's a great answer, Ms. Kara. Um, do we have any uh, questions? Maybe we have time for one more question. All right, so Ms. Casey Balatbat asks, how do I get over the fear of blank paper and thought of not being creative enough? The fear of blank paper. I have children that I work with that have that. And I have these really weird, I have these really, um, what do you call this, naughty teacher tricks that I do with them. So when we're working with kids and then they're like, really, they don't want to touch the paint. They don't want to touch anything. What I do is when their hands are there, I stick a little piece of paint on their finger. And then they notice it. They start freaking out. Oh, no, oh, no, I have paint on my page, my paper, my paper paint on my finger and then they smudge it on the paper, the paper yeah. to get rid of it mm -hmm. and then they get distracted Ooh, what is that what did I do you know so sometimes to be able to get over the hump of the blank sheet of paper is to just make your first mistake mm -hmm. because when we're so worried about not doing it right it stops us but you know life is filled with beautiful mistakes so we may as well enjoy making them Great. That's a great. That's a great mindset. You know, um, doing the mistakes in order uh, for us to get the process started. Yeah, get uh, the process started, and then just enjoy it. Like, where is this gonna take me? I wonder. You know, you open it up. Yes, correct. Okay, I think we have one time for one last question. Uh, we'll wait for it to come up on the screen. How can we maintain childlike creativity as adults? 
I think this is a similar question to the last one, where the other one that we were talking about, um, learning from the masters, which is the kids themselves. So it's to really observe. If you have a child that is young around you, then it's great. That's the best opportunity. It's to get into their world. Yes. You know, so when you're playing with them, you're not actually telling them what to play because then you're coming at it from an adult. You try and bring in your own little character. <laughs> And then you see, will they accept my character? Will they ignore me? You know, am I interesting enough? And then you start to enjoy by seeing, are you going to be able to get into their world? So that's the childlike creativity. And once you start to get a sense of what that is, when you're doing your art, when you're doing your work, you could be a doctor. You could have that sense of adventure in you. You know, and we need this, this creativity muscle. We need this to be able to plan for a future that we don't quite know what will be. Exactly. So even the children that we're raising, how are we preparing them for a future we don't know what it's going to look like? So this is a very important muscle, if not the most important muscle we need to work with for the kids of today. That's correct. Beautiful, beautiful answer, Ms. Kara. Thank you for that. All right. Thanks for sending in your questions, everybody. Um, thank you, Kara. Thank you very thank much. You. Very enjoyable session. Um, I think most of our viewers on Facebook and uh, at people at home have enjoyed themselves as well. Um, and we now realize that art truly has a way to make us heal and be mindful of our spirits. Thank you again, Kara. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Don't go just yet because we'll... We'll be taking a 30-minute break and be back for our second speaker, Raymond Gutierrez, with his session, If, an art workshop on rediscovering purpose. But before we go to break, let me thank our partners once more. Buen Solido Architects and British Council, our event partners, and Adobo Magazine after our official media partner. Thank you and see you later, everybody.